the Lord be with you. Well, today we're going to continue working through our series, looking at the 12 minor prophets, and today we will, we will be looking at the 11th of the 12. So if you can believe it, we are already to the almost end of our, our series working through these. And if you would, turn with me, if you haven't already, to the book of Zechariah. If you look in chapter 1, verses, verse 1 of Zechariah, it gives us kind of a time frame and um, a historical background a little bit. It says, in the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Ido, the prophet. So what we're seeing here is it says that this is occurring, or the word is coming to this prophet Zechariah in the um, in the second year of King Darius. Now, once again, that is the king of Persia. So this gives us a time frame to let us know that he is a contemporary of the prophet Haggai, which is the prophet we looked at last week. So if you can remember kind of what was going on um, with Haggai, the, the Israelites had just returned back to the homeland after spending uh, roughly about 70 years in Babylonian exile and captivity. And so they've finally been freed. They've come back to the homeland. And what we saw with Haggai is he was encouraging them to rebuild the temple, right? They had gotten there and they had worked for a period of time. They had started on the foundation and then they had quit for roughly 16 years. And so Haggai starts to encourage them as they've been out of exile now and they're in the homeland to continue to build God's house. Well, Zechariah just comes along two months after the first oracle of Haggai. So literally, Haggai gives the first call, build his house, and now Zechariah, two months later, basically continues to give a, a new word. So there's two prophets basically going on at the same time here, kind of encouraging them. And so that's kind of what this book is about. The word of Zechariah, or the book of Zechariah, is a word of encouragement for the people of Israel to keep going, to, to seek the Lord, to return to the Lord. And that will be through not only their their building of the temple, but also through their, their worship and through their lifestyles. And so we see this structure of the book really being broken up into to three different sections, if you can kind of think of it in that way. And Zechariah, it, it contains 14 chapters, so it's actually longer than many of the other minor prophets because usually they're, they're called minor because of the, their, they have shorter books or shorter materials. Well, this is one of the longer uh, minor prophets, but the structure of the book really starts out with chapters 1 to 6, being the first focus. And what it, what it has basically is Zechariah begins with a call to repentance, right, which is a, a very common theme for prophets. They will call the people back to God to return to the Lord. And then what we see through chapters 1 to 6 is these eight night visions that Zechariah receives. He receives within the night these different visions, and they're actually kind of, they're really kind of strange because you see like um, these men on the horse, and you see them traveling around the world, and you see there's this woman who's put in a basket, and then there's other women that have stork wings, and take the basket and take the woman, and you see all of these weird um, images and, and, and depictions going on within the visions. But ultimately, what they're meant to do is they're meant to encourage the people of God and to let them know that God has a plan for them, that God has a purpose to bless Israel again, and these images are meant to symbolize that fact. And in fact, after each of these visions, you typically will see the angel of the Lord, who I believe to be the pre-incarnate Christ, giving an explanation of the vision. So you'll see the vision, Zechariah will see it, and then the angel of the Lord will then explain what this signifies or what this means for the people of God. So chapters 1 to 6, it basically contains those eight visions. Then 7 and 8, chapter 7 and 8, what they do is basically give it a deeper call to repentance. So you have at the very beginning of the book a, a call to return, and then there's a deeper call because there was a, a question or a dispute about fasting. They were wondering if they had to maintain their, their, their feast and their fasting, like the certain disciplines that they had. And he basically explains that it's so important that we don't just fast for ritualistic reasons, but rather that we actually serve the Lord faithfully, that we do it from a heart of, and a desire for, for worshiping and honoring God. So we don't just fast just to fast. We fast because we love the Lord. And so he calls them once again to, to deep and meaningful worship. And then finally, chapters 9 to 14 is the, the third section of the book. And what we find here is actually probably the most Messiah-heavy section of all of the minor prophets. Zechariah is probably the most messianic 
prophet of them all. Um, the only one really that's different, would, or more than that, would probably be Isaiah, which is one of the major prophets. And so what we then see in 9 to 14 is a promise that there will be a day where Israel's kingdom through God will be fulfilled and it will be consummated and it's going to be seen through the, um, the advent or the arrival of this king. And, and you'll see in chapter 9 how it describes him coming um, humbly on a donkey and then it'll transition and explain how he also will come and eventually uh, he'll take over and he'll, he'll be the king over the entire earth and um, all the nations will come to worship him and he will usher in prosperity and peace to the world. And so that's kind of the way that it ends. It ends with this promise of the day of the Lord being a day of peace and prosperity and hope for the people of God, if they would just continue to seek him and honor him with what they've been called to do. So we see then this, this encouraging word of hope for this, this Messiah figure, this king that is to come in the same time frame that Haggai is calling the people of God to build his temple and to restore proper worship to God. So as we think about this, the first thing that I want to just encourage us to think about is that we need to, I think, remember that God has a plan for his people. God has a plan for his people. And now that means if you are uh, one of his people, then that means he has a plan for you. So you can actually personalize this. Don't just think, it's one thing it's good to think corporately, but also think individually here. If you are someone that is a part of the family of God, if you worship and love the Lord, then hear this, God has a plan for you. But sometimes we look at life And we don't always think about it like that, do we? Sometimes we see how life can almost seem random. It can be chaotic, right, stressful. And as a result, it can make us sometimes feel like we've been forgotten by God. Or maybe that God has forsaken us. Or maybe he doesn't really have a plan for us. He's just kind of letting us go through the motions of life. And we're just going to see how it all turns out. But that's not the biblical worldview for the people of God. See, when we as the people of God look at our lives, we can have confidence that God is working things out and he actually has a perfect plan for his people. I think what we see is God actively is involved in our lives and he has a purposeful plan for our future. And I am reminded of the book of Esther, which I know many of us have worked through on Wednesday nights together. And what was so profound to me as I was studying that book is in the book of Esther, God is never mentioned. You know, it's one of the books of the Bible, right? God is never mentioned, and it's describing a similar period of time, right? Because Zechariah is talking about the people of God who have just left Persia, right? They left that kingdom, and they're in their homeland. Well, Esther is the people that stayed in Persia. But what's so cool is that Esther is describing all of these different things that are happening for the people of God there, and how the enemy is trying to destroy them, and how life is just getting horrible, right? And God's never mentioned, but you see how through the story, God is working still. How God, though he's unseen, we can still clearly see his providential hand. God is working things out for his people, and I think Esther's a great example of that, and that's what life looks like for us sometimes. We're going to, to work, we're, we're, we're relating to one another, right? We're, we're trying to make an income, trying to provide for families, trying to think about the future, right? We're dealing with health issues, we're de- dealing with all of these different things that come in our lives. And sometimes we, we miss the fact that though we might not hear God's audible voice, we might not see his face, God is working, and he's working this plan out for the people of God. And I think that we see this in Jeremiah 29, 11. It says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Now, this is written by the prophet Jeremiah, who is talking to the people of Israel during the Babylonian exile right? So now these people at this point were, they were in despair. They were discouraged because they had been destroyed by a pagan wicked nation. And they were thinking to themselves, God, have you left us? Have you given up on us? Is there no plan? Is there no peace? Is there no prosperity in our future? And we see the prophet says in this exile, he says, I have a future and a hope planned for you. And now we see in Zechariah, And look, he's already gotten them out of that exile. But they're once again still feeling that question of, God, are you with us? God, do you have a plan? Is it going to work out in the end? I know many of us probably think about that. Is it going to work out in the end whenever you're going through these different challenges, these different um, problems in life? 
But I think what he's showing us is that God has not abandoned his people. And likewise, that means for the church. Though he's, Jeremiah is talking to the people of Israel here, I think this can be applied to the people of God that we can know in Christ he will not abandon us. That he does have a, a plan of redemption, a, a plan of salvation for the kingdom of God and for his people. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, it says, In him, that is Christ, also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So what it's saying is that the people of God, we have an inheritance that is promised to us. And not only that, that it's been planned, it's been predestined, and it's all according to God's counsel of his own will. So God has this beautiful plan, this perfect plan, that it's going to result in us receiving an inheritance, and it's been throughout history how he's working this plan out for his people. Likewise, Romans 8, 28, I know many of us uh, probably know this verse, it says, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. God is working all things out for good for those who love God. That doesn't mean that everything that happens is good, but he will utilize everything in your life, even the things that look random, even the things that look chaotic. He's going to use all of that for his plan, which is going to bring him glory and you good. That's what's so powerful, is we can literally look at our lives and have a confident um, assurance that God is working things out. He has a plan for his people. And I bring this up because in this book, I think it's reminding us how God will remember his people. God doesn't forget his people. He remembers them. In Psalm 105, 8, it says, He remembers his covenant forever. The word which he commanded for a thousand generations. So we know that the people of God, the people of Israel, they were under a covenant, right? And he will remember that covenant forever. We as the body of Christ, we partake of communion, reminding ourselves of the new covenant. He will remember that covenant with us forever. He remembers these things. And what's, the reason I bring this up is because the name Zechariah the prophet, you know what the name Zechariah means? It means Yahweh remembers or remembered by Yahweh. So it's so cool. I love how all these prophets, if you look at the minor prophets and you see the name of the prophet and then you look at what it, the name of the prophet means, it almost always ties into the message of the book in some way. And so I think we're seeing here is that as Zechariah is speaking, and anytime you see his name mentioned in the book, it's another reminder for those who knew the Hebrew, God remembers. He has a plan. He has not forsaken us. He's not forgotten us. And I think that we see then some examples of his desire and his plan for his people in, in chapter 1, verse 3. It says, Therefore say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. See, you see his desire here? It's not that he's ever left them. It's that they left him. And he says, Return to me. See, once again, it's not God, you know, just waiting and not saying anything. He's sending prophets to them. And he's saying, return to me. He wants that relationship. He cares about his people. Likewise, we see in verse 14 of chapter 1, it says, So the angel who spoke with me said to me, Proclaim, uh, proclaim saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am zealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with great zeal. God says, I have zeal for my people. I care. I love my people. And then finally in chapter 1, verse 16, it says, Therefore, thus says the Lord, I am returning to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall be built in it. Thus says the Lord of hosts. And the surveyor's line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem. So we see this desire, this zeal, this love for God and his people and how he desires to give them mercy and to build them up again, to build his house so that they can have his presence and experience his glory once again. So we, we clearly see that God is a God who cares about his people, that has a plan for his people. And as I mentioned, chapters 1 to 6, what it does is it has all of these different visions, now, what's so cool is all eight visions that Zechariah receives are meant to signify that same thing, that same thought, that God's promise and his plan is to bless Israel. 
So as we think about these visions, and I'm going to briefly give you a little bit of a summary of the different visions that are going on here, they're all a reminder for the people of God, I have a plan. Trust my word. Trust my promise. It's just constantly giving us that same reminder. Don't forget this. God has a plan. So in chapter 1, verses 7 to 17, we see there's a vision of the horseman. And what this vision signifies is that God promises to show mercy to Jerusalem and to restore it. In chapter 1, verse 18 to 21, we see the vision of the four horsemen and four craftsmen. Now what this describes is how Israel had been destroyed in the past by some of these pagan nations, but how God will judge Israel's oppressors. In chapter 2, verses 1 to 13, we see there's the vision of the measuring line. And what we're seeing here is that God is promising to be a protective wall of fire around Jerusalem. In chapter 3, verses 1 to 10, we see the vision of Joshua the high priest. That's the one that we read this morning. And what this is meant to signify is God promises forgiveness, restoration, and a future king. And then we see in chapter 4, verses 1 to 14, the vision of the golden lampstand and the two olive trees. And what we're seeing here is that God is going to provide spiritual nourishment by the power of his spirit through the individuals of Zerubbabel, which was the governor, and Joshua, the high priest. In chapter 5, verses 1 to 4, we see the vision of the flying scroll. And here this is describing how God will judge sin. In chapter 5, verses 5 to 11, we see the vision of the woman in the basket. That's the one that's really crazy. You have this woman getting shoved in a basket, women with storks, stork wings flying and taking her away. And what that's meant to describe is that God will remove sin from the land. It's the woman is being described as sin incarnate and is being whisked away and, and taken to a pagan land. And then we also see in chapter 6, verse 1, 8, we see vision, the vision of the four chariots. And what this is describing is God will one day come and he will judge and restore the four corners of the earth. So those are eight visions. And if you notice how they're constantly giving this assurance, this confidence to his people, it's a plan to restore his people and how he's going to judge the nations and righteousness. And it's ultimately going to foreshadow how the fulfillment of all of this comes in the Messiah. The, the promised anointed one, the promised Davidic king. So we see all of these things just to remind us God is working a plan for his people. And so once again, I want to call the people of God to remember this. And remember this, if you are not dead, that means that God's not done with you, with his plan. All of you are alive today, right? So if God still has your heart beating and you're still breathing, God has a plan and he's working his plan out through his people. Now the question is, are you one of the rebellious people like some of these individuals that need to hear the call to repent, to return. That's what repent means. It literally means to change your mind in the New Testament, and in the Old Testament it means return back to God. Maybe you need to hear that. Maybe you haven't been living right to honor God. You haven't been focusing on worshiping Him properly, living a life that honors Him. Maybe you need to hear that and get back on the plan. Now, God can use even your sin and rebellion. He can use it for good, but ultimately, he's calling you back to be on his plan, to be on his timetable, to be within his will. And those who have been faithful, who are continuously serving God, that love the Lord, they want to see his plan fulfilled, continue on. Continue working that path, walking in his will. So that's the first thing I think we see is that God has a plan for his people. He will not abandon. He remembers his people, and he is calling us to faithfully walk in that reality. The next thing that we see, I think, and I'm going to zoom in here now on the third chapter of Zechariah, which is the one that was read this morning, and it's the vision of Joshua, the high priest. I think that we, we hear this call to, to repent, right, or, or to seek the Lord and to recognize his plan, and when we do that, I think we see this result here uh, of chapter three, and I think what we're going to find is that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ, now, I say that because you're going to be like, well, we don't see Christ mentioned here, right? You don't see Jesus read in chapter 3, but the thing is you're going to see elements that are pointing us to the gospel. You're going to see us um, foreshadowing the Messiah, which, by the way, Messiah in Hebrew is the same meaning of the term Christ in Greek, right? So they're both referring to the same individual, the Messiah or the Christ, right? So chapter 3, what the vision essentially is showing us 
is that you have Joshua, right, the high priest. So you had Zerubbabel, who was the governor, who we, we addressed a little bit last week. And you have Joshua, who was serving as the high priest. He was responsible for the spiritual matters of the people of Israel. And so what Zechariah does is he enters this vision at night. He sees, um, he sees uh, Joshua, the high priest, standing there. And he's covered in these dirty garments, these dirty clothes. And he's standing before the angel of the Lord. And then right to the right of him, it says that Satan is there. And Satan is there accusing Joshua the high priest, basically saying he's guilty for all these things, right? And so then what happens is you have God, through the angel of the Lord, basically rebuking Satan. And he's basically saying, I have chosen Joshua. I have chosen the people of God, Israel, Jerusalem. I have chosen them, so he rebukes Satan, silences Satan, and then what he does is he gives him new garments, rich robes to wear, cleans them up. And then Zechariah chimes in and says, and put a turban on him too. Give him a nice clean hat to wear, right? And then right after that, you see that there's this ongoing uh, promise of this coming branch that's mentioned um, and being described it, it, right following that vision. So what is this um, vision, what is it describing? Well, the first thing that I want to just really uh, point from this in verse 1 of chapter 3 we see Satan accusing Joshua the high priest, right? It says that he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at the right hand to oppose him. That is who Satan is. Satan is the adversary. He's the accuser, the slanderer. That's what his job is. That's what he wants to do to the people of God. In fact, in chapter, Revelation chapter 12, verses 9 to 10, he's, he's basically referred to that. He, it says, so the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength in the kingdom of God, of our God, and the power of Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. So it describes Satan as the dragon, the devil, but it also says he's the accuser of the brethren. And he did it day and night. And so I think what we see here is Satan doing what he does. He's accusing Joshua the high priest. And what I think is interesting here is that this is the godliest person in the godliest nation. You realize this is the high priest. He's supposed to be the most holy guy, right? Because he's supposed to be the spiritual representative for, for the people. And Israel is God's chosen nation who is supposed to be morally superior, right? So now we have the godliest person in the godliest nation, and he himself is being accused by Satan. Now what I think we see then from this is if Satan can accuse Joshua, he can accuse us. If he can accuse God's high priest, he can also accuse us. Because here's the thing, as I've mentioned, he was wearing dirty garments. And we're going to see this describes his sin as well as the people of Israel's sin. So what Satan is saying here isn't false. He actually is right in saying what he's done wrong. He's, he's actually accusing him. He wants to point out the fact that he's guilty, right? But what's so cool is that this is going to reveal the gospel to us, right? Why we need grace. Because here's the thing. The church is not a place where perfect people get together. I know that sometimes the world thinks that the church, we just think we're all perfect all the time. That's not true. Just because we, we call one another to repentance, because we, we seek after perfection, doesn't mean that we think that we are perfect. It recognizes that we're not perfect, right? So we're actually going to see that the church, God's people, are not perfect. They are sinners. And the thing is, on our best day, we still need the grace of God. Think about this. On your best day, right? There are some times where we, you know, we've messed up. Maybe we have some issues with our relationships. Maybe we fell into the same habitual sin that we've been struggling with, right? Maybe we feel down or anxious or, or lost, right? And there are times where you're like, God, I need your grace, right? There are times where we feel like that. We're like, I really need God's grace. But then there are other moments where we've been in the Word regularly, steadfast. We've been praying. We've been fasting. We feel pretty good. We've been in church. We've been serving people. We've been giving faithfully, right? You're doing all these things. You, maybe you've brought like 10 people to the Lord recently, right? You're, you're just like, you're like, you've got a spiritual high going on. Even on that best day, you fully need the grace of God. Because even with all of those amazing things you're doing, if you don't have the grace of God, you're still guilty. You're still going to be accused by Satan. And so I think this is what it's showing us then, because here's the thing. Sometimes we're going to feel that defeat. 
We're going to feel like the enemy is winning, and we're going to feel guilty. And that's exactly what the devil wants. He wants you to feel that weight. But the thing is, we are promised, in, or we are told in Proverbs twenty four sixteen, when we fall down, we are to get back up. It says, Proverbs twenty four sixteen. it says, For a righteous man may fall seven times and rise again, but the wicked shall fall by calamity. So what we're called to do is there are times that we will fall down even though we are God's people. But in those moments, that's when we cling to God's grace. When we fall down, we say, God, I know I have your grace. Your grace is sufficient for me. Your grace is my strength. And by that fact, we can then rise again. We can get back up and continuously serve the Lord. Even in the times where we feel like we are defeated, we feel like the enemy is winning, or we feel like the enemy is accusing us and bringing up our past, because in in verse 2 of chapter 3, we see God silences Satan. It says, And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. See, this is what God says to Satan. This is what he says for his people. When Satan is bringing up all of these accusations, like I said, many things are true. You got divorced. You cheated on your spouse. You've been an alcoholic. You've been addicted to drugs. You have a, a cursing mouth. You, you, you're a deceitful person. You, you have all of these different things you've done in your life. Satan is bringing all of these things up. He doesn't miss a beat. He wants you to get everything, you know, he wants to bring everything to light to God. He wants you to be found guilty. But when God hears all of this stuff, you know what he says? Shut up, Satan. That's what God says. God says, I don't care. He is silencing Satan, and then through the gospel, that's what Christ came to do. Christ came to silence Satan in all of our accusers. Romans 8, 1 to 2. This is read in our call to worship this morning. It says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life is in Christ Jesus, and he has made free from the law of sin made us free from the law of sin and death. That is the promise in the gospel. When we are being accused, when we see our sin, we see that we are, are defeated or, or weakened, or, you know, we have all of these things going on, God is saying, there is no condemnation in my son, Jesus Christ. It's this promise of redemption. God will restore us. He forgives us. But I think that sometimes we hear this, that there is no condemnation in Christ, but there are sometimes that we allow these voices to enter us and, and, and to, to bother us and, and to plague us, right? And sometimes it's, it's not even Satan. Sometimes it's other people, right? Sometimes there are people that will say something about your past, right? They'll bring up your past whenever you're not there anymore. That's not who you are anymore, but they want to bring it up to you. They want to make you feel guilty again. You know, there was a time I was working out at the gym here in Carterville, and I, I, I saw a, a friend of mine that I hadn't seen in many years. We, we went to high school together, and it was nice. We were talking, just catching up a little bit, seeing what they were doing now. And then he had mentioned something about me in high school that I don't even remember. But apparently it was something that, that stuck out to him and that he remembered, and he thought it was kind of funny, but it, it kind of painted me in a not a very good light. And it made me feel not really good about myself for a little bit. And I was thinking to myself, was I like that? Did I say that or did I do that? And I start thinking about my past, and then it brings up other things as you start thinking about maybe your high school days or your past and your college or whatever you're at, and you start to feel worse and worse and worse, and you're feeling this, you know, this condemnation that is just overwhelming you for a moment. But then I have to remind myself, I'm not that person. I'm in Christ, there is no condemnation, and I am pursuing holiness every day. We shouldn't be the same person we were yesterday. We shouldn't be the same person that we walked in the building earlier this morning. We should be continuously growing, becoming more and more and more like Christ because we are accepted by God through the finished work of Christ. When Jesus went to the cross, he said, it is finished. He has paid the fine. He has paid our guilt. It says that he actually condemned sin on the cross. Your sin has already been condemned. So don't feel guilty about your past. I'm not saying, by the way, that it's okay just to live sinful, by the way. I'm not saying live sinful, live it out. But I am saying let it go and trust in God. 
Trust in God's grace. Recognize I need God's grace. But once you receive God's grace, rejoice. Rejoice in the grace of God. That's what we need. That's what the gospel is. We, we receive it with an empty hand of faith. God gives us this gift of grace, and we are to receive it. And what does it look like? Well, we see in verses 3 and 4 what that grace looks like. So not only does he hear the accusations, does he rebuke and silence Satan over the accusations, but then we see now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him saying, take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, see, I have removed your iniquity from you and I will clothe you with rich robes. That's what God does. See, God sees us as his holy priesthood. And there are times where we get our garments dirty with our sin. You know what he does? He he rebukes Satan, and he says, give me those. I'm getting rid of these dirty clothes, taking them off, and I'm going to give you clean, rich robes to wear. See, that's the thing. Not only does he he recognize the, the dirt, does he get rid of the dirt, right? He doesn't leave us naked. He clothes us with the best garments he could possibly give. That's who Christ is. He is, we are clothed in Christ. That is why we're not condemned. We are wearing the righteousness of Christ in our lives. And so that is why we can can have confidence standing before the Lord. We see this cleansing and we see this transformation going on, correct? In 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Remember that. When the adversary is accusing you of your past, of your failures, of your weakness, remind yourself, I am a new creation. All things have passed away. Let go of your past. Let go of those things and trust in Christ. The thing is, sometimes we identify more with our weakness, with our failures, than we do identify with Christ in his victory, in his strength. The gospel is saying, identify with Christ, not who you were in your old flesh. Are you identifying with who Christ is? And then that will encourage us to pursue him more. So we need to identify with him and his strength and his victory and his holiness And then we find that when we do that, we become more than conquerors. Not only does it say that the the people of God become conquerors, it says you become more than conquerors because of Christ's love for us. Because when we feel like we're guilty, when we feel like we're going to be condemned, he says, I got you. There's no condemnation. You have salvation. You have righteousness. You have these new garments. And we need to celebrate that fact. And I love in verse 5, as I've mentioned, and so what happens here after this is going on, Zechariah finally pipes up in this vision, right? And he says, give him a new turban, a clean turban. I think what this might remind us of is when we see other people being cleansed and transformed, we want to encourage that. See, we want to encourage one another in righteousness, right? We want to celebrate when people are being redeemed, when people are being forgiven. We don't want to be that Christian that keeps bringing up the past. We don't want to be that Christian that makes our brothers and sisters feel like they are condemned. We want one another to be encouraged in the fact that we, there is no condemnation, right? So we need to celebrate one another. We need to support one another. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't times that we challenge. We also need to challenge one another. We need to correct one another at times, but it's always through love. It's always through the hope that we are bringing and leading them towards Christ. That is the goal. There is no condemnation for the body of Christ. So that is a part of the plan. God's plan for his people is that there will be no condemnation. And then finally, right after we see this vision of of Joshua the high priest, there's this promise in verses 6 to the end of the chapter, of chapter 3. And what it's showing us is that the reason that we can have this reality, that we will be cleansed, that we will be forgiven, that there is no condemnation, is because Christ and his kingdom are coming. See, it describes the branch, this coming branch. And in verses uh, 8 to 10, it says this. Hear, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your companions who sit before you, for they are a wondrous sign. For behold, I am bringing forth my servant, the branch, 
For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon the stone are seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave its inscription, says the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, everyone will invite his neighbor under his vine and under his fig tree. What it's saying is in one day, when the branch comes, your iniquity will be removed. Think about the woman in the basket again. Just like the woman was taken away, that's what happens to your sin. It is taken away, and it's all because of this branch. Well, the, the, the word, the branch, that's a messianic title. Just like the root of Jesse, there's the branch. And what this is describing is that there is someone who is going to be a descendant of King David. That's what this is describing, a messianic coming king. And so this branch is literally des described as the descendant of David who's coming to be the king, and the king is going to take away all of your sin. I believe this is what happens on the cross. When he dies on the cross, he takes away our sin. And then I think it's my, maybe telescoping to the end where we are all invited to come under his tree. All where we can prosper together, fellowship with one another, we invite one another to take refuge under what the branch has accomplished. We see another prophecy of the same thought process of the branch in chapter 6. Verses 12 to 13, it says, Then speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, from his place he shall branch out, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Yes, he shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule on his throne. So he shall be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. So now it's saying that this branch is coming. He's going to branch out. He's going to expand. And the way that he's going to rule on a throne is as a priest. So we see that the branch is not only is he kingly, but he's also priestly. And that is why we are going to be able to reign as well as serve as priests because the branch serves that function for us. He is the king and he is also our high priest. He is the one that mediates between us and God the Father. And there's this promise that, that the council of peace will surround his dominion. So we see there's this, this prophecy of the Messiah, the branch that is going to come and he's going to rule and what's so cool about this is if you know the New Testament, you know the Gospels, you start to see really these things being fulfilled one by one. In Zechariah 9.9, 9, I know many of us probably know this text, it says that, it says to rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, so many of us know this. This is what we celebrate on Palm Sunday. All four Gospels record this thing. It says in Zechariah 9.9, it prophesied that your king is going to come on a donkey. On the, last, or the, first, or the Sunday of the last week of Christ's life, he enters Jerusalem on a donkey, letting everyone know that that prophecy that happened 500 years ago is about me. He says, I'm coming to be your Messiah, your King. I am the Christ coming to bring peace to the land. Likewise, we see in chapter 11, verses 12 and 13, another prophecy being fulfilled. It says, so it was broken on that day. Thus the poor of the flock who were watching me knew that it was the word of the Lord. Then I said to them, if it is agreeable to you, give me my wages. And if not, refrain. So they weighed out for my wages 30 pieces of silver. Now, many of you will know, Jesus was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver by Judas Iscariot. And these verses are also referenced in the New Testament. Christ fulfilled it. So now we see it describes his advent, where the coming Christ is going to come, where he's going to enter Jerusalem humbly on a donkey, where he's going to be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Well, it goes on in chapter 12, verse 10. It says this, it says, And I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one who mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one who grieves for a firstborn. So now it's describing this individual is going to die. And he's going to be pierced. We know Jesus was pierced by a spear on the cross. And we know that many people mourned over the fact that they had killed their promised Messiah. So we see once again, Jesus fulfilling. 
And then one more on the first advent of Christ we see in chapter 13, verse 7. And it says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is my companion, says the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. Then I will turn my hand against the little ones. Once again, the shepherd in the Gospels was struck, and his sheep scattered. It was fulfilled. So we literally see the life, we see the rejection, we see the betrayal, we see the death. We see all of these things fulfilled in the life of Christ. See, Jesus fulfills all of these things. And I wonder how many of these individuals that were reading this book of Zechariah or were hearing his words at that time, 500 years before Christ, if they were saying, yeah, I'm not sure if I believe that. Do they, do they really expect and believe on that day he was going to come because that was the problem. Israel rejected him when he came, right? Zechariah 9 was, fi- uh, was fulfilled in Christ. D- did they really believe it? Were they prepared? Because the thing is, we have also promises in this book, things that have not been fulfilled yet. And I wonder, are we going to be like the people of God, the people of Israel at this time, and not be prepared? Are we not going to be ready? Do we not really believe it? I think we're called here in the text to live faithfully and obediently in anticipation for the return of Christ. Because Christ didn't only come, he's also coming. He's coming with his kingdom. In chapter 14, the final chapter of the book, in verses 3 to 4, it says, Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations. As he fights in the day of the battle, And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And on the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half of it toward the south. And then just moving down a little bit more in verse 9, it says, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth in that day. It shall be. The Lord is one, and his name is one one. So what this is literally saying is that the king that God is going to come down, he's going to fight war against the enemies of God. He's going to judge the nations, right? And it says he's going to arrive on the Mount of Olives. You know where Jesus ascended from? The Mount of Olives. You know where he said he's going to come back? The Mount of Olives. And you see this being fulfilled in Revelation 19, 11 to 16, it literally says this. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. See, that's what we hope for. See, just like the people of Israel here, they had a hope in the coming of Messiah. So too we have this hope, and it's right there in Revelation 19. He's coming. He's going to make war on the nations. He's going to bring peace and prosperity. He has a plan that will result in our salvation, our redemption, no condemnation. Our sin will be removed forever. That is the hope that we have here. Let us rejoice, let us us have hope and and faith and, and live a life faithfully waiting for that day. Because there will be a day where every knee is going to bow to King Jesus. Every single tongue is going to confess who he is, that he is the Messiah. Jesus is the Christ, he's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The only question is, are you going to be the person that's celebrating, that's been prepared? Or are you going to be the one that's in fear and terror because you don't know him? So that's what I think we see in the book of Zechariah. We see God has a plan for his people. There is no condemnation in Christ the Messiah. And ultimately, we need to remember that not only did Christ come once, but he and his kingdom are coming again. Let us pray. Father, we love you and we do give you praise. And we thank you for your word and and these prophets that give us so many beautiful, sweet truths. And that we see Christ clearly in them. 
We see the gospel proclaimed to us once again that we are seeing your plan in action. We see your redemptive work through history and that it results that there is no condemnation for those who trust in Christ, who return to you. And that ultimately we are to live faithfully, obediently as we prepare ourselves, anticipate the coming of Christ and his kingdom. That we would pray that your will be done and that your kingdom would come. We give you all the praise. We thank you for salvation. We thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen.